Good morning. Uh, I'm Stapleton Roy. I'm the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, I'm delighted you all are able to join us here today for this book launch of a authoritative new ambassador, uh, new autobiography. <laughs> my mind is, uh, I haven't had my coffee yet. Uh, an authoritative new biography of Deng Xiaoping, who is not simply one of the great leaders of the 20th century, but in my judgment is one of the great leaders in world history. Because the transformation taking place in China is on a scale that is unprecedented in world history in terms of both the scope and the speed with which it has been taking place. So understanding how a person like Deng Xiaoping was able to launch a process that China had been struggling with for over a hundred years to bring China into the modern world and to provide prosperity for the people at the same time. Uh, this is not a, an everyday occurrence. Chinese leaders had had the power in the past, but not the right ideas, that had the right ideas, but not the power. Deng, for the first time, combined the two together. And understanding how a person born in an obscure village in Sichuan could emerge with the vision and the personal leadership skills to launch this transformation in China requires detailed work of the sort that Professor Vogel has provided. Uh, I'm delighted that we're able to do this here at the Woodrow Wilson Center because as many of you know, the Woodrow Wilson Center was created by Congress as a living memorial to the only president in US history who in fact was a scholar and could perhaps, if he had been interested in China, written a biography <laughs> of Deng Xiaoping. Uh, so we're very pleased to have you here. The way we're starting this is Professor Vogel has done extraordinary research uh, in preparing his book. But curiously, he never had the opportunity to meet Deng Xiaoping. Uh, General Scowcroft is going to lead off with some of his personal reflections on Deng Xiaoping based on his meetings uh, with Deng Xiaoping over the years. And uh, I am then going to add a few comments of my own because my official responsibilities uh, happen to put me into contact with Deng Xiaoping on numerous occasions. And then we'll turn the floor over to Professor Vogel, who will comment on some of the insights provided by his book. And then there will be opportunity for some interchanges here. So uh, General Scowcroft, could I ask you to lead off? Or uh, Without my coffee? Uh, the coffee's <laughs> on the way. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you want to say something? Do you want to say I anything? Want, no, I want you to go first. OK. OK. All right. <coughs> Well, uh, I met Deng Xiaoping a number of times, and uh, he was one of the most fascinating individuals I ever met. And I have to say, the first thing about him to me is he's very un-Chinese. Uh, just very unusual as a human being. Uh, you know, when you, when you meet with the Chinese, you always meet in a U-shaped formation of chairs. And the two principals sit not facing each other, but facing out. And at its worst, you sit there and you talk to the wall that's opposite you. And sometimes you never even look at the one next to you. Well. Uh, Deng had that arrangement, uh, as all Chinese are. But Deng, who, he makes me look like a giant. He was a little bitty man. <laughs> and he was right in your face. <laughs> like this, you know. Uh, no sitting there talking to the wall. You he get was, your coffee because you shook your fist at me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right in your face. Uh, and he always had a spittoon. He was a chain smoker. And most of you don't know what that is even anymore. But <laughs> a, a chain smoker literally 
is lighting a cigarette off the butt of the cigarette you're already smoking. And he did that just constantly. And he always had a spittoon. I presume a lot of you don't know what a spittoon <laughs> is. <either. laughs> but a spittoon is a little is a little brass pot into which you throw cigarette butts, spit, and anything else that you want. He always had a spittoon right in front of him, which he used liberally. <laughs> so he was extremely colorful. I first met him uh, in my only meeting with Mao, and it was just before Mao had purged him for the Oh, I don't know how many times he got that, purged by that. That was the third time. That, that was the Two, third twice time. Twice by Mao and then and three in all. Yeah. And he he was in the meeting, and Mao referred him to him one time pretty negatively. And in retrospect, it's obvious what was going to happen to him. He was going to be purged again. Uh, but where I really uh, had my fundamental meeting with him was right after Tiananmen Square. And at Tiananmen, after Tiananmen Square, President Bush Sr. Uh, said, we have to do something. This is, a, this is an outrageous act. We have to do something. But we don't, do not want to jeopardize this relationship. So he said, uh, I'm going to call Deng Xiaoping. So he tried to call Deng Xiaoping, and the answer from the Chinese side was, uh, our leaders don't talk on the telephone. So I went over to the Chinese embassy, and told the ambassador about the phone call and the response, and uh, said, you know, the president would would like to send an emissary to talk over the situation. Uh, would that be acceptable? Uh, well, by the time I got back to the White House, the answer was, you bet. <laughs> that would be acceptable. Uh, well, we had just put sanctions on China. Actually, before Tiananmen Square, we had a lot of Activity with the Chinese military. A lot of it dealt with uh, observation posts in western China so we could observe uh, Soviet missile launches and so on. But we sold them some military equipment and so on. And that's what we had cut off. Uh, so I, with Larry Eagleburger, who was uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of State, uh, went over secretly uh, to uh, meet with the Chinese. We flew in a military aircraft with aerial refueling so we wouldn't have to land in Alaska or somewhere, which you had to do at, those t at that time. And uh, got there and uh, met with Deng Xiaoping. And at that time, the Chinese were just in the midst of a big changeover of personnel. And Deng was stepping down uh, uh, Li Peng and Jiang Zemin uh, and Chen Shichen, the foreign minister, were all uh, brand new at that time. So I got over there and uh, met with Deng, and Deng said, uh, he said, I'm meeting you because you're an old friend. Uh, I am no longer uh, in power, and uh, you have no business being here. Uh, but uh, I'm going to meet you because you're an old friend. So we uh, sat down, and Deng said, said, I just want you to know that what we have done at Tiananmen Square is none of your business. It's an internal Chinese matter. And uh, you're, you are just interfering, and I tell you that uh, as an old friend. Well, that wasn't a very auspicious start for, for me. But I said, 
you're right. What you did is your own business. But the consequences for the outside world of what you did is importantly our business as well. And that's what we want to talk about. So with that, we talked for, uh, oh, about two hours. And he said, well, I've done my job. You can talk to the new leadership now. And, uh, uh, and Dung got up and left and left me with uh, Lee Pung, who was a very different kind of personality from, <laughs> <laughs> from uh, Dung Xiaoping. But uh, he was just a remarkable figure. And I think his, his own personal history and his relationship with Mao, which Ezra just goes through in wonderful detail, fill in some insights for me because Deng is the one that really put China on its course. And I think that he did it because he lived through the various shifts that Deng made. Deng was a believer in permanent revolution. Uh, you know, Mao, was. Mao, Mao, Mao was. Yes. Uh, Mao, Mao, a believer in, in, in permanent revolution. And you needed a revolution about every eight years. Because as soon as you had a revolution and you put new leaders in, they became bureaucrats and stuck in their ways. And so uh, Deng was a recipient of that permanent revolution. Uh, and when he finally emerged, uh, he realized that uh, China was really in sad shape from all of this turmoil that had consumed it since, uh, uh, since Mao came to power and that they couldn't ride this tiger. They, the communist leadership, couldn't ride this tiger unless they did something different. And that something different was to give the Chinese something to live for. And that, and that turned out to be, if we can just increase the standard of living of the average Chinese a little bit every year, they will be content, they will support us, and uh, everything will be fine. Stability was the important thing, stability. And that's what he started. And so he says, I don't care whether a cat is black or white as long as it can catch mice. Uh, to get rich is glorious. So they turned their back on, on a communist political system and put in a system which advanced Chinese living standards actually dramatically, not just gradually, dramatically year by year, importantly starting with, uh, with the peasants. And that was his way of assuring... Uh, stability. And boy, did it work. And that's the China that we're dealing with now. It's the product of Mao and that course of action. Uh, and uh, I wish we had the product of dung. I keep getting the two mixed. I hope you all straighten me out. Uh, I wish we had him right now. Uh, he was just a remarkable person. Why don't, why don't I quit there? That was super. Thank you, uh, General <coughs> Scowcroft. I'll just add a few comments of my own. Uh, I was never an interlocutor with Deng Xiaoping. I was always present at meetings with him as a note taker or a fly on the wall. But my official duties in Beijing uh, put me in situations where I had frequent uh, contact with him. Uh, this included, I can't remember now whether it was four or five, what was it, uh, Ezra, in the secret negotiations? How many times did Ambassador Woodcock? I don't remember any better than you. I think it was, it was five, four or five times it five, but, when basically yeah. it was just Ambassador Woodcock and, uh, and, and me. 
uh, meeting with Deng Xiaoping and one or two foreign ministry uh, people for the final stages of the negotiations for establishing diplomatic relations. And uh, the issue of Taiwan arms sales uh, occurred in those meetings, and Deng lost his temper, and I had a chance to see a top leader uh, wrestling with something that was an imperative for China to do, but which involved a decision that was extremely difficult <coughs> to take. And uh, he, he made the decision. It was the right decision. It was good for China. It was good for the United States. But it didn't solve the issue, which continues to this day. It's rare to be in a room when a foreign leader makes a tough decision. In my diplomatic career, it's only happened in China, and it's only happened with Deng Xiaoping. Because on a second occasion, uh, when we were trying to resolve the claims of private American citizens against China for property confiscated after the communists took over, uh, I was in the room when cabinet members, I think the Minister of Finance was one of them, was arguing against the agreement, and Deng approved the terms that were favorable from the United States standpoint uh, and made the decision right then. And the decision was so controversial that a foreign ministry official rushed up to me right after the meeting and said, quick, we've got to get this signed uh, promptly uh, because he was afraid it might get reversed in the process. My recollection, Steve, maybe you remember, uh, is that the finance minister lost his job, actually, uh, in part as a result of, uh, of that agreement. But it was the right decision, because without it, we would not have been able to conclude a commercial agreement with China that gave them most favored nation treatment for their exports to the United States. And without that, the trade development between the two countries uh, wouldn't have developed. Uh, I was also president at two small lunches with Deng Xiaoping, one of which General Scowcroft was at with uh, former President Ford, uh, who visited China. And you had a chance to see Deng in a, in a more relaxed atmosphere. And as I recall, Brent, you can uh, cor correct me on this, a, uh, President Ford raised the issue of hadn't China made a mistake by backing Vietnam during the Vietnam War because it turned out that Vietnam adopted policies that were detrimental to China's interests. And Deng's response was, no. It was the right thing to do. You were an enemy of China. Vietnam was an enemy of you to support an enemy of another enemy is the right thing to do. If you had been our friend at the time, he said, things would have been different. So this was a cl classic example of, of Deng's pragmatism at work. But pragmatism is overused. Uh, the word that I would use to describe Deng Xiaoping is no nonsense. Uh, after the nonsense that you encountered everywhere in China during the Cultural Revolution, it was such a breath of fresh air to have a Chinese leader emerge whose sole goal was to get decisions made and a process established to move things forward. And in general, it was in the right direction. Uh, when you dealt with Deng Xiaoping, he didn't want to discuss philosophy. He didn't want to sort of schmooze about the world situation. He wanted to find out where the differences were, what we could do to resolve them, and how to move things forward. And these issues are explored at length in uh, Professor Vogel's book. He provides insights that would have been so helpful to those of us who were actually working the issues at the time if we had had the background available that Professor Vogel has been able to dig up. So uh, it's with great anticipation that I look forward to Professor Vogel's comments about his own book. First of all, I want to say what a great honor it is to be with two distinguished people <clears throat> who had so close contact with Deng Xiaoping, and also to be in front of such a distinguished audience. I know many of you, and know many of you have played important roles uh, in the U.S.-China relationship, and it's a great honor to, to be with you. Let me, first of all, just make a few comments about the context of uh, both these uh, uh, speakers. Uh, of what what they are describing. <clears throat> My job as a historian uh, is to try to fill in the background as well as I can, and, and many things I say, of course, are repeated in my book. The book is so long and so detailed, it's hard to think of anything to say that isn't in there already. <clears throat> but 
I think, uh, let me say a word about the context of, of the Scowcroft uh, visit in 1989. And, of course, Brent knows these things better than I do. But I think it was a, a very uh, strong uh, commitment of President Bush Sr. to maintain relations with China. And after Tiananmen, when so many people were so angered, and all of us, I think, felt the agony of shooting people uh, on the streets, uh, to feel that this relationship with China was very hard to get on order. It, it took many years, uh, and the politics of both sides kept interfering with it. And it was so hard to get that relationship, and it was important to keep that relationship. And also, uh, of course, uh, President Bush Sr. had a special relationship with Deng. Uh, it was lucky, I think, that in 1975, just at the time when Bush Sr. Uh, was head of the liaison office in Beijing, Deng was in charge of things uh, for that one year. And so they had very close, built up a very close relationship. And I think the combination of that relationship uh, and uh, undoubtedly influenced the, the way he went about trying to keep the relationship between the two countries and how important it was to maintain that relationship. Let, let me uh, also comment on how I think Deng felt at that time, and, I, I, and Brent knows these things very well too, but I think it was very grim. You know, things were collapsing in Eastern Europe and, and the Soviet Union, uh, uh, and... Uh, he had, he had not only worried about foreign opposition, but he worried about his own students, and the place was, he was really afraid it was going to fall apart. I think on May 20th, when he sent in uh, troops to keep order through martial law, and then that failed, the citizens were standing behind the students. Uh, I think he was really worried the place was going to fall apart, and that he had to take drastic action, and then his uh, Ambassador Roy says, you know, after all the 150 years of chaos up to 1949 and the chaos of the Cultural Revolution and stymied Chinese progress, he wasn't going to allow that chaos to take place, and he felt he had to move. Um, <clears throat> so I think he was really in a very grim mood and felt that there wasn't much China could do, and it was really the United States that had to take the action he would hope that they would sometimes relieve sanctions. And he felt that uh, American business in a few years uh, would be pressuring the American government uh, to reopen uh, more contacts. He said the capitalist countries forget things and they have politics and they change for a few years. And he had kind of a constancy that would last longer. And therefore, uh, he felt that uh, sooner or later, uh, that uh, the Western countries would again expand their context, and I, and I think he proved correct. Can I make sure. one comment? Sure. Apropos of that. Yeah. Uh, because uh, after after my first meeting with Dung uh, after Tiananmen Square, uh, w that was not an operative meeting. It was just keeping the relationship together. But President Bush sent me back again uh, in December of that same year after he had met with Gorbachev at Malta to explain to the Chinese what the meeting was all about and so on. And at that time, I met Deng again. Uh, he, he really was formally retired by that time. Uh, but we organized a roadmap to get the relationship back on track again. And that roadmap started with the first tentative steps, and then came the Romanian execution of Ceausescu. And that, that's just to undersco underscore what Ezra said. That just shut everything down again, because the Chinese were scared to death. They hadn't, they hadn't minded so much Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary, because they thought these guys weren't real communists anyway. But Ceausescu, that, that was communism. And when he left, they really got scared. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, 
I think, you know, Cercesco had given an award to Dunn uh, not long before that. Cercesco had been very instrumental in reestablishing better contacts with the Soviet Union, and uh, they were praising Cercesco for standing firm. And then when he was shot in the back uh, by his own people, that got Dung's attention. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let me just make a couple of uh, comments on the context that uh, State played out. Um, the 1975 Ford visit, I think, is, is very interesting because he seemed relaxed at that time, and Americans didn't realize that he was already under pressure at that time. And to me, it's a remarkable feat that he was able to go in that meeting and be in a relaxed way when the criticism sessions of himself had already uh, begun at that time. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, I think the, the negotiations that uh, uh, Woodcock and Stape uh, carried on were really uh, the critical things. Of course, they succeeded in getting normalization. And then uh, Deng had to decide if arms sales are going to continue to Taiwan, do you normalize or not? And he made the decision, go ahead. Uh, and that had consequences I'll come to uh, in a minute. But I think uh, it, sh it shows uh, that he was determined uh, to go ahead uh, with that relationship, how important that, that relationship was. What I thought I'd, I'd do today in the less than a half hour, uh, roughly half hour I have, is to try to trace his thinking in foreign policy and s sort of give the outlines of, of kind of highlight what I've learned is I think are the most important things in, in how he thought about foreign policy. Um, I, I, I think it really begins uh, in 1919, 1920. In 1919, he was a high school student, and uh, after May 4th, when the demonstration started in Beijing, uh, he was in a high school in uh, Guangdong County in Sichuan. Uh, but uh, a lot of progressive uh, teachers in those schools were encouraging the students to be patriotic, and he was one of those. And so he took to the streets and was involved in those parades and demonstrations after May 4th that were critical of Chinese leaders who yielded and who had no power uh, in dealing uh, with the, the powers of the world that met at Versailles and that were particularly taking part of China that formerly belonged to Germany and giving it to Japan instead of giving it back to China. So he became... I think a patriot already. He was 14 years old in the spring of 1919. And I think it was a very critical formative period and he continued throughout the summer uh, to take part in boycotts against Japan at that point. Uh, now in 1920, at age 16, well, his father got him in a school uh, that same year uh, in Chongqing that was preparing to send uh, students uh, to France. And France was then the most important, uh, considered in China the most important country to send people to to learn about the world. Uh, after uh, Deng opened in 1978, of course, it was the United States. But in that time, French culture uh, seemed so outstanding. France uh, had been a place where a lot of Chinese workers had gone during World War I, and a number of people had this idea of what they called Qin Gong Jin Xie, where they would be combined work and study, uh, and they would they didn't have the money in those days, and the Chinese students uh, didn't have uh, scholarships like they do today, but some very outstanding Chinese students. There were over 1,500 uh, students from China in France. Now that's a, a drop in the bucket compared to what's come to the United States since that time, but it was by far the largest group of Chinese students anywhere. And he was one of those in France. Uh, when the people who planned these, uh, I think they didn't understand the changing world economics because they made these decisions uh, during World War I. And at that time, there was a great shortage of labor. And the Chinese who went there uh, were given jobs right away. Uh, by the time Deng arrived, it was 1920. Uh, the war had ended. Uh, the Frenchmen who survived the war were back at work, 
and there, it was much harder to get jobs. So the Chinese who had gone, they were the kind of elite uh, who would have gone to nowadays to Tsinghua and Beida and come uh, to the United States on scholarship. Uh, in those days, uh, not only did they ha they have to give up their idea of study, uh, but they, the kind of work they found was at the very bottom of the scale. Uh, French workers were working very hard, uh, and the Chinese uh, workers were even uh, below that, and they had trouble even getting any job. The first job that Dung had at a place called Schneider's uh, <clears throat> in southern uh, uh, France. Uh, he had a, a bolt and steel. He had to carry big labs, this little five-foot guy. Uh, he didn't last a month, and his uncle, who was three years older, lasted a couple more weeks, but it, it was just too much for him. Uh, and then he was able to get some other uh, jobs, but they were at the bottom of the scale. He arrived in 1920. Uh, and the Chinese government uh, was ending the scholarship support, uh, and uh, the uh, founders of the scholarship program were ending their support. And uh, the students felt privileged. They, it's, it's interesting, there's a picture in 1924 of these people uh, get together. They all have wonderful suits, and they may have been supplied by the photographer, uh, but they look like young gentlemen. They they don't look like the people who would be out on the streets. They look like a, you know, Oxford debating club or, or uh, uh, maybe even Harvard when we used to wear suits and ties. Uh, but they were were a very elite group, and yet these guys were the ones who were doing this terrible, uh, dirty work. If they were lucky to get enough jobs, this was three years after the uh, Russian Revolution. And when they started their study groups, uh, a lot of the things they learned from Marx and Lenin seems to make sense to them. Uh, the imperialist powers uh, were strong, and China was uh, at the bottom end of that. The uh, uh, workers were living miserably, uh, and uh, capitalists, uh, houses and uh, cafes uh, uh, were living beautifully. And so I, th I think the, the communist explanation in their study group gelled. And so it was uh, a group of elite people who identified with the workers uh, and who, who wanted to make change in China. A lot of them did not necessarily have uh, important positions during the revolutionary days, but after 1949, when you needed people to build the country, there were quite a few in that group who played really important parts. Uh, this picture in 1924, Zhou Enlai is in the center. He's a few years older than Deng and knew a lot more about what was going on. But also in that picture, you see Li Fuchun, who was in charge of the first five-year plan. You see Nia Rongjun, who was in charge of uh, scientific development for the military. And you see Deng Xiaoping. Uh, that, it's quite an interesting, important group uh, who knew more about the outside world and were prepared to deal with the outside world. Uh, although Deng, you know, lived uh, a very poor life, somehow he acquired a, a taste for uh, French wine and croissant uh, that he was able to, uh, and cheese, uh, that he was able to uh, make use of later. Uh, but uh, this was a very formative uh, period. Then he, after five years, they, the Chinese students were demonstrating by 1925 uh, in front of the Chinese embassy and for France, for, uh, particularly after there was a big demonstration in Shanghai in 1925 uh, that France was still colluding with this terrible Chinese government uh, and uh, imperial powers who were shooting down workers in Shanghai. And so Deng in uh, 1925, was about to get arrested, escaped to the Soviet Union. He arrived in the Soviet Union in January 1926. Sun Yat-sen had died in uh, 1925, just, and the Soviet Comintern uh, set up this school, named after Sun Yat-sen, uh, to train uh, worker, uh, Comintern workers in China for the revolution. So he was in that very first group and got a sense of Soviet planning. And I think one of the most important things that hasn't received enough attention is to think through what kind of economy 
Soviet had at the time he was there. Chun Yun, who later led the five-year plans and planning apparatus, arrived in Moscow in the mid-30s for a couple years, and he learned about five-year plans and socialist structure. But when Deng was there, it was new economic policy, NEP. And new economic policy meant the party was in charge, but you had an economy that was open to the world, encouraging world uh, developments. Uh, you had a market economy with, with Communist Party in charge. Uh, <clears throat> so the idea that Deng came up with in 1978 of the party being in charge with having a market economy was not entirely new to Deng. And in the mid-20s, when he was in the Soviet Union, that party was that policy was succeeding quite well. They had fairly rapid growth. They, China, the Soviet Union at that time was growing faster than most Western economies. Uh, so that had, I think, also uh, a big impact. Fast forward then to 1952. Uh, 1952, uh, Deng uh, moved from uh, Sichuan, where he was uh, located in charge of the Southwest, uh, to Beijing, where he was in charge uh, of uh, party affairs. And he had been in government affairs first, but then he moved in charge of party affairs. Now, in party affairs, he met with foreigners from Communist Party countries. He didn't meet with Westerners. And so from about 1952, uh, way up until about 1973, the foreigners that Deng met with were largely from the Soviet Union. And uh, he was sent to Moscow, if I remember correctly, seven times. Uh, and one of those times was in 1956, uh, at the time when Khrushchev denounced Stalin. And he wasn't given a copy. Uh, he wasn't allowed to attend the session, but he was given a copy of the speech right afterwards and immediately signaled how important it was uh, that in 1920, uh, at that time, uh, that uh, it was going to be a loss of authority for the party because anybody uh, who was associated with Stalin, nearly everybody was, uh, was tarred with that complete denunciation. It was just too much to, for the system to bear, and the Communist Party uh, was weakened by this denunciation of Stalin because it had gone too far. And he handled that very well. He, uh, he was uh, only the deputy in charge of that delegation. Judah, the military, was in charge. But the political issues were really handled by Deng, who then reported to Mao. Uh, and they were able to respond uh, at that time. And Mao was very cautious and worried, of course, uh, about that denunciation of the top leader. And they took some steps to, to adjust. So. But then, when the relationships with the Soviet Union began to go bad, uh, Deng was the key person who carried on the arguments with the Soviet Union. And Mao, in 1957, uh, visited the Soviet Union. We have this famous speech where the east wind will uh, surpass the west wind uh, and encourage the Soviets to stand stronger against the west. And Deng, <coughs> at that time, uh, was a part of that uh, delegation, and Mao pointed to him, to the Soviet leaders, uh, after Deng had carried on arguments with the Soviets and said, that guy, little guy has a big future in the China. Uh, and a lot of people took that as meaning that he was going to be certainly one of the leading candidates to be successor uh, to Mao. Uh, so he uh, carried on the arguments in the early 1960s, famous nine letters against the Soviet Union, the main person in charge of those was Deng. He was carrying out Mao's uh, views of being criticism. And in 1963, he goes uh, to the Soviet Union and carries on again uh, the arguments with Suslov that kind of broke the relationship, it fell apart. Uh, and Deng was carrying on those arguments. And I personally think that um, just at that time where, where Deng was trying to get his distance from Mao after he could see that the Greeley Forward had failed and was trying to make some adaptations in industry and agriculture. 
and Mao said about Deng, why is it he's always sitting in the back of the audience and not listening very well? He's already a little deaf already and doesn't hear what I say and not listening to me. I think at that time, after Great Leap Forward, he was trying to distance himself from Mao so he could have a little space so he could adapt to the conditions uh, that he felt uh, needed to be responded. But I think the fact that he was so tough on the Soviet Union uh, was a plus in keeping a relationship with Mao because in 1963 when he attacked uh, Suslov, Mao was so proud of the strong way in which he really pushed him uh, that uh, I think that helped keep uh, Mao uh, somewhat uh, more sympathetic to Deng than he might have been otherwise. Uh, okay, now we fast forward uh, after the uh, Great Leap, uh, after the uh, Cultural Revolution. Uh, and the Cultural Revolution, of course, when Nixon and Kissinger uh, came uh, to uh, Beijing, uh, Deng was out in Jiangxi, uh, Soviet period, uh, he, uh, near, near where he had, not too far from where he had been during the Jiangxi Soviet period. Uh, he, he was in a, in a, in a nice building, uh, and here I think the fact that Mao had bonded with Deng way back in the early 1930s. The first time Deng was purged was in Jiangxi, uh, and he was uh, thrown out of his positions. Uh, what was he criticized for? He was criticizing for being the head of the Mao clique. Uh, and so I think that kind of bonded Deng with Mao at a very early stage. It was painful at the time, but in the long run, when Mao rose to power, uh, Deng was one of his boys and always worked very closely with Mao. One of the things that Deng wrote when he was in Moscow in 1927 is that when he had to write essays as part of the class, is that uh, organization requires discipline. And uh, Deng would be very disciplined, uh, and he always would obey and move right away. And he was always very disciplined, always willing to follow uh, Mao's orders, attack the intellectuals in 1957, he, he did it. Uh, start the Great Leap Forward, he did it. But I think there was a big change around 1959, uh, is my best guess. His, his daughter, Deng Rong, told me that uh, he began to change when he realized how uh, the Great Leap Forward uh, was failing and was causing such suffering to the country and that Mao was not adequately correcting for it. And I think uh, Deng also was sympathetic with Peng De Huai. He had served under Peng De Huai in World War II, and uh, he knew that Peng De Huai was not a bad person, didn't want to have to criticize Peng De Huai. And so he began to some, uh, get distance himself somewhat. I'm talking about foreign relations. I can get caught in all these d details. And down, uh, Deng then comes back from the Cultural Revolution in 1973. Uh, my friend David Gergen uh, makes the point that a lot of leaders like Churchill uh, and de Gaulle, uh, Abraham Lincoln, who had held high positions, uh, uh, then fell into the wilderness. And while they were in the wilderness, they had an opportunity to get a clear vision of what they wanted to do. So that when they came back, they had a, a general approach. Uh, now, Deng said you cross the river by uh, stepping stones. Uh, it wasn't a leap across the river. It wasn't a clear, uh, strict policy. It wasn't a detailed policy. But he had a general direction when he came back. In 1973, when he comes back, Mao decides that uh, Zhou Enlai uh, was too soft uh, with the United States. He was uh, yielding too much to Henry Kissinger's. Uh, he was even, uh, that Zhou Enlai was even willing to consider uh, a, a different formula for Taiwan that would give a little more uh, leeway to America to have closer relations with Taiwan than Japan had. <coughs> And Mao also felt that uh, uh, Zhou Enlai was getting uh, a little too much popularity, and he th therefore uh, began to turn to, to Deng to carry on uh, the foreign policy. Now, uh, Deng, uh, Zhou Enlai already had cancer at that time, but Gao Wenchen, who I think who has gone through the uh, 
that Joan Lai files in his, probably as much detail as anybody who has written about them, uh, says that the, the reason Mao uh, was tough was not because, uh, the, the reason Mao turned to Deng was not because of the cancer, but because he was really quite critical of Zhou Enlai at the time. So Deng uh, then, in 1973, first begins to sit in on sessions with foreign leaders, and within a year or so, he was the person in charge. So he was kind of an apprentice uh, to Zhou Enlai in learning how to deal with foreign countries. Uh, in his first uh, trip abroad, uh, in the spring of 1974, when he went to the United Nations, uh, and Henry uh, said he seemed to have been on a training mission uh, at that time, compared to John Lai, who had been running foreign policy for 30 years, was so suave and so knowledgeable uh, that compared to that, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, was uh, kind of rough. And I, I think also at the time, uh, Deng was very concerned about not going outside of Mao's wishes, that uh, it was better to be a little quiet and cautious and not say too much and not get in trouble with Mao. And, and so uh, Deng was not behaving like he was later when, uh, when uh, Brent uh, and uh, State met him. He, he was not in charge, and uh, so he was very, very cautious uh, in uh, 1974. Uh, his first uh, big trip abroad uh, to a Western country in 1975, and of course he picked France. <clears throat> France had been unusually forward in uh, recognizing China in 1962 and having closer relations, and so in thinking about the West, uh, st France was ready to give him a state visit in all the splendor that they give honored foreign guests. And Deng uh, accepted that and went to France. And he could see at that time, he took enough people with him that he could see that a lot of, he was allowed to see factories, that the changes were far greater than he had imagined, uh, and that there was a gap that they had to work to fill. So I think that trip to France in 1975 had a big uh, impact on him. Then uh, he is criticized for the third time by Mao. Uh, and he comes back after Mao's death uh, in the summer of 1977 and under Hua Guofeng. Uh, because Hua Guofeng had so little experience in foreign policy, uh, Deng was really given the lead in foreign policy. And during this period from 1973 through the end of 1975, uh, he had become for almost uh, two years uh, the key person that foreign visitors met, and he hosted the visit. Uh, since Japan had normalized relations in 1972, there were an awful lot of Japanese coming, and so more than uh, any other country, uh, Japanese groups were very plentiful. I estimate you may have seen 30 or 40 delegations from Japan uh, from all backgrounds. Uh, and uh, he was beginning to get an understanding. Uh, he, he could not yet control a policy. It was not a big forward-looking policy, but he was allowed by Mao, at least during that year, 74, 75, to try to bring order and to try to stabilize relations with those countries. When he comes back in 1977, Hua Guofeng had known so little about foreign policy that Deng remained the person in charge of foreign policy. <clears throat> when I asked Li Guan Yu, when I interviewed him about the visit of Deng and his foreign policy, I asked him, if uh, Deng learned a lot from his foreign policy advisors, and Lee Guan Yu's answer was, oh no, they listened to Deng. Deng had had more experience, he'd been around, he'd seen things, uh, he knew what was going on, and the people in the foreign ministry who accompanied him were trying to struggle to keep up. It was not the case of a leader uh, who was taking advice from them. He, some details, of course, he could learn. He, was, he read reports in great detail every morning. Uh, way back in World War II, one of the uh, Americans uh, who visited uh, uh, Deng uh, commented that uh, when he met Deng, he was just amazed at the knowledge this person had of foreign affairs. Uh, that uh, obviously Deng, after being in France, could read reports of what was going on and took a great interest in them. 
I think there was a huge difference between Mao, who had never really been abroad uh, before he came to power, and Deng, who had had six years abroad. Uh, and uh, therefore, when Deng read reports uh, that were coming from Xinhua or the foreign ministry or the, the reports from the cabinet or whatever, uh, that uh, he had a much better understanding, and I think he continued uh, to develop his knowledge so that uh, after 77, when he came back, he already had quite a strong basis. Uh, <clears throat> in 1977, uh, Deng uh, was coming back. He was in charge of uh, science, technology, and education. And his first uh, forays into foreign policy were to try to get more scientists to come back. Uh, he saw the there were three Nobel Prize winners in the United States who were Chinese Americans. Uh, he brought all those people back. He he brought um, Frank Gibney from Encyclopedia Britannica before Google. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, carried a lot of world knowledge, and that seemed to be a good way of trying to bring world knowledge and get the Encyclopedia Britannica quickly translated uh, into Chinese. So he 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 was beginning uh, to try to get the science and technology, which he thought would be the key to the development of the modernizations. And this was a, 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 about a year and a half already before he came to power in, in the late 78. Uh, late 78, he, uh, Hua Guofeng uh, is pushed aside from the main position, although Deng was still called vice chairman and uh, vice uh, deputy premier and so forth. Uh, but uh, he was really in, in charge of everything at that point uh, and had the lead position. And I think at, at that time, uh, uh, by the time he had come back, uh, he could see that they were going to. He had already made preparations from mid '77 until '70 at the end of '78 <coughs> for uh, good relations with uh, the two key capitalist countries, Japan and the United States, so that they could help uh, with the modernization. He felt that as he looked at uh, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea. They, they all benefited from openness to the world, and he was going to open the country wide and get that same kind of uh, benefit uh, and bring uh, all those uh, powers, uh, resources uh, to China. He didn't have a strict model, but he was going to learn from everywhere and get the best he could. So already uh, beginning in, in 77 when he came back, he began to prepare the way for that. Uh, by uh, trying to form closer relations with, uh, unfortunately, Vance uh, and the Carter administration. Uh, when Vance visited in late 77, uh, Carter was not yet ready to move with normalization. He wanted to get the Panama Treaty through Congress first. And it wasn't until Zbig went in May 78 uh, that uh, Carter had given the go-ahead to begin talks with normalization. Uh, uh, by the way, when I talked with uh, Sharon Woodcock, the wife of Ambassador Woodcock, uh, she said when uh, Woodcock uh, was beginning uh, his job in Beijing, he said there's one foreign service officer that he wanted to get as his deputy, and that was Stape Roy. Uh, he said Stape was a little too young for his service, uh, but he thought Stape was the most qualified and would do the job. And so Stape played the key role in, of course, supporting uh, Woodcock in those negotiations uh, that began in the middle of uh, 1978 and that were completed in the way that uh, Stape uh, uh, mentioned. So uh, you get uh, normalization in uh, 1978. And then after that, uh, of course, Taiwan uh, passed the Taiwan Relations Act. And Deng, uh, who had to make that snap decision uh, that he would form relations even if they we sold arms to Taiwan. Then his next step was to do everything he could to put pressure on the United States to slow down and, and stop those arms. And he tried every way he could. And he got particularly upset, of course, when Reagan began to run for president and talked about deepening relations with Taiwan. And he was so upset that he was almost uh, ready to break relations. <clears throat> One document that I wasn't able to get was the private discussions between President Bush Sr. 
and uh, Dunn, when they talked, I think it was May 1982, uh, uh, but it led up to the third communique. And uh, I, I think it's clear to me, at least, that they made the basic decisions that would put some limits on arms sales and that Ambassador Hummel, was he, uh, hum, Hummel, oh, Ambassador, Hummel was the ambassador. ambassador at that time, and Hummel and Huang Hua then carried out the, le the negotiations and prepared the August uh, communique, which put some limits on arms sales, and then Deng was ready to again form relationships with the United States. Go ahead, uh, just, just a little anecdote. Uh, President Bush uh, told me at that time uh, that uh, Reagan had made some pretty inflammatory statements about Taiwan. So he sent, uh, uh, he sent his vice presidential candidate over to mollify the Chinese. And he said uh, he was, he, Bush, was sitting in there with, Dung explaining how Reagan didn't mean all this and so on, and and an aide brought a piece of paper in. Dung looked at him. He says, "He's done it again." <laughs> <laughs> um, I know Dick Solomon and others in those uh, days described Dung as feisty, <laughs> and I think um, he, as far as I can tell, he didn't go out of the ba bounds of diplomatic uh, behavior. But there was no question about how he felt, and he was a very determined, straightforward, a straight shooter, uh, and uh, as as uh, Stapes says, no nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when he was angry, you know, he he made it quite clear. Uh, let me uh, conclude with 1989 after uh, those demonstrations, uh, and after. Uh, 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 Brandt went to uh, Beijing. Deng said that uh, uh, even with all those sanctions, we need not only to keep open, we need to keep open wider. I think that's really remarkable Who, for someone who felt that the foreign powers were uh, encouraging the demonstrators and uh, causing uh, greater problems for him, that he still felt that China needed to, to keep open uh, to all the science and all the technology and all the economy. Uh, one of the famous sayings that's now been debated in China the last year or so is the expression Tao Guang Yang Hui. Uh, it means avoid the limelight uh, and try to keep things uh, uh, rather quiet. Don't, 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 don't be inflammatory. And uh, Deng was very convinced that the Soviet Union made a serious error by spending so much on military that it exhausted itself. And he felt that it was much more important to have good relations with the other countries. And by 1989, he even restored relationships with the Soviet Union. So during his career, he had, he had normalized relations with Japan and the United States. He had uh, done what he could to preserve the relationships uh, with the West. Uh, and he wanted to keep the country open. I'm convinced that if he were alive today, uh, he would still say we must avoid conflict with the Western powers and not get too ambitious, not behave like a hegemon. And it's my hope that the leaders of China will continue to respect the legacy uh, that Deng left them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Ezra, for those very interesting uh, comments. I neglected to mention at the beginning that our co-host for this session today is the Cold War History Project here at the uh, Wilson Center, a uh, very important co-host because we're really talking about the definitive development in the Cold War, which altered the whole global landscape in a, in a very significant way, and Dung was a very important player in that. I also remember the visit by Vice Presidential Candidate uh, Bush to, uh, uh, to Beijing in 1980 19. at a time when Presidential Candidate Reagan was making s statements <laughs> on Taiwan that were difficult. Uh, later President Bush, as I recall, having been head of the Liaison Office back in 1974, uh, 
75, uh, at a time when our common concern about the Soviet Union was sufficient to enable the Taiwan issue, which hadn't, we hadn't had a meeting of minds on how to handle it, could be treated as a secondary issue. And when he came to Beijing, he intended to convince Deng that candidate Reagan was going to be so tough on the Soviet Union that the Taiwan issue should again be uh, treated as a secondary issue. And when he presented that proposition to Deng, Deng was totally unreceptive because in his view, we had reached an understanding on how to handle Taiwan. Candidate Reagan was trying to undo that understanding and it was an unsatisfactory approach. So it was not an entirely satisfactory uh, uh, meeting from, from the standpoint of- <laughs> What's not? Yes, and, and, and they were quite unhappy. Uh, one of the real strong points of the biography is the details provided during this period from 1977 to 1981 when Deng Xiaoping was coming back to power and the maneuvering that accompanied his pushing Hua Guofeng aside, putting his own people into the key positions, and uh, then emerging as the acknowledged top leader in China. When we were in the final stages of the negotiations for normalization, we recognized that Deng was the key figure, but Hua Guofeng held all the top posts. And as part of the normalization arrangements, we wanted to invite the top leader in China to visit the United States, and we didn't know how to do that because there was a discrepancy between who we thought was the top leader and who was actually the top leader. So it was phrased that we wanted a senior leader from China to visit the United States after normalization. Deng Xiaoping said, I accept. <laughs> <laughs> so that confirmed to us uh, what we had presumed was the case. But the background for it is provided in detail in, um, in Ezra's book. Uh, I'm just going to ask the first question briefly, Ezra, because you've touched on this. My recollection from one of these small lunches that I was a fly on the wall at uh, uh, during that period is that Deng was very circumspect in his handling of Mao Zedong and that in fact he defended Deng's legacy, uh, he defended Mao's legacy and treated Mao as the necessary leader of the Chinese Revolution, but that he did acknowledge that Mao had made some mistakes on economic policy. And this gets into this question that you touched on of what were Deng's real feelings at the time of the Great Leap Forward. He wasn't present at the Lushan Plenum, and the interesting question is, if he had been president, present, would he have supported Peng Dehuai in his criticism of the Great Leap, or would he have been politic in not addressing the issue openly? Uh, did you, you mentioned that uh, Deng Rong uh, commented on some of this. Did you uncover any additional information that relates to Deng's private attitudes on this disastrous uh, uh, step by Mao? I don't know whether I uncovered any secrets, but I, you know, putting all the little things together, I think it's very clear how upset he was at the Cultural uh, Revolution. When Nakasone asked him what was the most difficult period in his life, he said the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one clue. Uh, and then Deng Rung, uh, as you say, uh, told me that uh, her father began to realize the, cult, the, cult, the culture of evolution, that greatly forward was wrong, uh, and that he was very upset at the culture of evolution. And then the fact that they were sent down, they had to do an hour every morning of Mao Zedong's study. Uh, I think his daughter makes it very clear uh, that wasn't what he wanted to do. Um, I, I, my analysis is this, that having seen what happened in the Soviet Union when Khrushchev denounced Stalin, he wanted to find a very different way in which he could relieve uh, 
uh, when he can let down Mao without uh, destroying the faith in the party and the structure. And um, uh, one of our Chinese historians, Joe Levinson, talks about how they put Confucius in the museum, uh, meaning it was, became detached from a lot of Chinese people's daily life. And I think uh, Deng's basic strategy was to give Mao, you know, high credit, uh, let his picture hang on Tiananmen Square, uh, and uh, give him all kinds of uh, honor. We still believe in the Mao Zedong's thought, uh, and it's still a basic principle. But as as Brent pointed out, uh, it doesn't matter if the cat's black or white if it catches mice. And to me, that's a, a brilliant way of handling the Mao issue. If uh, the Mao cat, you know, uh, catches the mice, fine. But if not, uh, you know, they find another way. And that was a way of, of departing from Mao without heavily criticizing him. Also, as I go through the many drafts of the, the uh, uh, document on party history that really dealt with the Mao question, uh, Deng always tried to position himself that he was announcing to the public to, that he was telling the drafters, no, you must emphasize the value of Mao. And that was kind of a public stance. But they wouldn't be criticizing Mao if they didn't have Deng's support. So the final resolution that said uh, Deng, that, of course, Mao made some mistakes uh, in his later e uh, period uh, and that we must correct those. But later when people asked Deng about that, he said it wasn't just Mao, it was all of us. We lacked experience, we made mistakes. Uh, and so I think ma ma uh, maybe pragmatic is not enough uh, to ex describe it, but I, I think his way of dealing with Mao was, was a very thoughtful, uh, you know, he put a lot of energy and it was a, was a major issue because uh, so much of Chinese way of doing things had been centered so much about Mao, and I think he felt he had to provide some opportunity to get some distance that to go a new path. And uh, it took about a year and a half uh, after uh, 78 before they finally passed it in mid-1981, this document, and went through draft after draft and was discussed by lots of people. So I think by the time it got through, he had really developed a consensus, a uh, broad-based consensus about uh, how to treat Mao. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the long-winded professorial. Uh, uh. So, uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, Bob, could you please identify yourselves, hmm? even if I know you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bob Hathaway here at the Wilson Center. Uh, Ezra, congratulations on, on magisterial work. Um, I have two questions, the first of which can probably be answered just yes or no. Um, we professors can find complicated uh, well, ways to say that. <laughs> uh, I think, though I'm not positive, that Ho Chi Minh was still in France in 1920. Is there any evidence that Dung across uh, pass with Ho? Uh, the second and, and perhaps more interesting question is, um, how did Dung become Dung? You've emphasized the importance <laughs> of the experiences in France and the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, General Scowcroft, uh, in a very striking phrase, uh, described Dung as very un-Chinese. Uh, do you agree? And if so, what other than perhaps the experiences overseas at a formative moment in his life made him un-Chinese? How did, how did he transcend his heritage, his background, um, and uh, if in fact you agree with uh, the, the description of being un-Chinese, what difference did, did that make? Uh, first of all, about Ho Chi Minh, they were in France at the same time, and uh, I, uh, Ho Chi Minh did meet Zhou Enlai in France and did contact him. I haven't come across any evidence that Deng met him. However, when Ho Chi Minh went to China later after uh, uh, 1949, uh, Deng met him several times. And there was one time uh, after they met Mao uh, that two people escorted him to the airport. One was Deng and the other was Zhou Enlai. So all three people who had been in France together in the early 1920s. 
Of course, uh, in France, uh, they were, you know, fellow revolutionaries uh, against uh, imperialism. But after, uh, by the Ho Chi Minh, you know, uh, in his last will and testament, talked about a grander role for uh, Vietnam and the Indochina Peninsula, and national interests, you know, began to diverge in the latter part of the Vietnam War. <clears throat> um, on the question of how did Dung uh, become Dung, um, <laughs> I, I would put it a little differently than, than Brent did. I don't think he was un-Chinese. I think China is big enough to have a lot of varieties of people. I mean, it's a huge country. Uh, his, uh, one of his ancestors was a, a high-level official. And I, I, Deng writes in his Moscow diary uh, that uh, his father wanted him to become a great official. Of course, by 1911, when Deng was seven, he had the change of... Uh, the 1911 revolution, so it was a very <laughs> different circuitous path to becoming an official. Uh, but I, I think one of the most important uh, aspects was the experience of a wartime military commander uh, from 1937 uh, to 1949 for almost 12 years, almost constant warfare. And the, the nature of guerrilla activity was uh, you fight and then you regroup. Mao was off in Yan'an, and Yan'an had a larger base area and was more secure. You could have talk philosophy, and Mao could write essays. Uh, and uh, Mao could, you could have an anti-Japanese academy and bring scholars to develop art and literature. But Deng was closer to the front lines, and he was up in Shanxi in the Taihang Mountains. And I took a trip up there just to try to get a feel of what kind of place it was. Uh, close to the front lines, uh, and uh, in that situation, he didn't have time to have big philosophy. He had to deal with the question of how do you recruit the troops, how do you enough grain and supplies to the troops, uh, and then how do you regroup after a battle and get ready for the next battle. <coughs> so I think it made him a very pragmatic thing. I think, I, you know, I... I I, I only spent two years in the military, and so I'm not really qualified to comment in general, but my impression is that, you know, somebody during wartime where you're constantly, in, you know, preparing for battle, it's very different than a civilian uh, military leader. And I think that made Dung, you know, very pragmatic. You don't, you don't waste time argument. Uh, he often said later on, Bu Zhenglun, you know, don't carry on arguments, just do something. And I think, I, th I think that ha is one of the most important formative uh, things about him. Uh, we also know that Deng was did very well. I mean, he was very smart. He uh, he did very well in school, and uh, he also was very long uh, an apprentice to Zhou Enlai and to Mao Zedong. Um, it's it reminds me of say a young person who works at the White House in his 20s and sort of sticks around at high levels all the way through his career. And uh, Dung had been around uh, Zhou Enlai and worked in his office. He was mimeographing and writing you know, propaganda sheets. Uh, but he had got to work under uh, Zhou, who was kind of the strategist for the movement in France. He got to work <coughs> under Mao <coughs> as the general secretary of the party. Uh, and he had seen ups and downs. He had seen changing relations with the Soviet Union. So I think on top of this uh, experience as a commander, very pragmatic, what can we do? And the, the guy as general secretary, uh, he was on the front line in dealing with problems from uh, 56 to 66 when he was general secretary of the party. Mao was up above uh, talking philosophy and deciding policy, but... Dung had to deal with the party secretaries under him in a very pragmatic way. So uh, I think by the time he started coming to power in 78, <clears throat> he knew policy so well. He was so confident 
that it could be very relaxed and be fun. I think a lot of people coming to power would not be very sure of themselves and would be very cautious and hesitant. But Deng was in such command of the history and the knowledge. He had such a clear uh, vision from his experience uh, several years in the countryside where he had time to think about it uh, that he could be relaxed and fun. And uh, Sharon Woodcock told me that one of the things she enjoyed in traveling with Deng around the country uh, was that uh, he and Deng's wife were so much themselves. And she said, she puts it that uh, he, he, he knew what he could do. He knew himself, and they were comfortable with themselves. So uh, that's my, you know, two bits about how Deng got to be Deng. Since General Scowcroft is president, I'm reluctant to interpret his words. But the way I understood his comment about Deng's un-Chineseness is that of all the Chinese leaders that I have dealt with, two of them had a distinctive style that set them apart from all the other leaders. One was Deng through his no-nonsense decisiveness and the way he handled things. The other is Jiang Zemin, who yeah. expressed his personality in his meetings with foreigners in ways that were uncharacteristic of the more guarded Chinese leaders that you usually meet with. So I interpreted the un-Chineseness as meaning that Deng was distinctive from other Chinese leaders, not that he was un-Chinese in a, oh, oh, in, in a sense. Is, is that a fair? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. He was different from the stereotype. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, yes? You. Yes. <laughs> oh, it, uh, I'll take you next. Right. Oh, thank you so much. I saw so many hands, but I'm picked up. Okay. Uh, my, name is, my name is Fan Zhang. I'm an international student from China. I study in George Washington University, Elliott School of International Affairs, concentrated on global communication. And so, yeah, thank you very much for giving us such a great uh, speak, and very uh, congratulations on the accomplish of the book. And I noticed someone uh, praised this book as, like, written for a tiny guy in a massive... Yao Ming size book. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And my question is, um, I know that many people say that Deng actually led China to uh, to uh, economic uh, democracy, but many Western people also criticize on him, like didn't bring any political democracy to China. So, what is your opinion about this question? And do you think are there anything related to Tiananmen Square? What happened there? or any frame that he, he was influenced by Mao? How do you uh, think about that? First of all, uh, I think it's not just Westerners. I think it's a lot of Chinese intellectuals, uh, particularly the ones who were devoted to Hui Bang, feel that Deng did not do as much as he could have for a Chinese democracy. I think it's wrong to say that he was against democracy. Again, when he was in the Soviet Union, he wrote uh, that uh, how much democracy a country has depends on its political conditions. And again, he made in a speech in 1957 essentially the same thing. Uh, how much you can democratize depends on those conditions. In uh, 1978, you recall that at the time of democracy wall, he first said, you know, why not let people, you know, write what they want to? And uh, he let uh, democracy well continue uh, for several weeks. But then he felt that conditions were getting out of hand. They were not just criticizing some of the old issues. They were considering the, criticizing the present party, and he felt that authority and discipline would fall apart. Uh, he didn't have a country that had the basis of democracy like we did. Uh, and so he felt that it was more tenuous in holding the country together. And so he stopped it with, as you know, with the four cardinal uh, principles uh, in the end of March 1979. Then again in August 1980, when some of the East European things started up, his first reaction was, well, we should have a, a little political reform in China. But by the end of the year, when things in Eastern Europe began to get out of hand, uh, he uh, was, began to get more worried, and he again clamped down. Again in 1986, 
uh, he allowed those move, movements, discussions to continue. There was there was a big study of political reform under Zhao Ziyang, and Deng had uh, allowed that to happen. And when the student movement started, when Feng Lijiu started preaching in 1986, uh, 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 he didn't stop it right away. He, but when it he thought it was developing too much that was threatening order, then he stopped it. And I think the same thing in the spring of 89. He didn't stop it right away. Uh, he allowed those things to go on to some, but then he felt it was getting out of hand. Then he felt uh, by uh, April 23rd uh, <coughs> that uh, you had it was it was getting too big, and you had to warn the students and to clean it down. So I, I think that it, it's wrong to say that he 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 opposed democracy. Uh, he he felt that uh, any system a country has uh, it, it depends on the conditions. And Hu Yaobang felt that the and many intellectuals. Uh, there's a, a magazine in, in uh, China called Yan Huang Chunqiu that some of you Chinese know. Uh, and I interviewed many people connected with that magazine. These are liberal, intellectual, former high officials uh, who try to push the envelope as much as they can. And because they're retired, they have considerable leeway. And many of them have great respect for Hu Yaobang and felt Deng could have done more. Uh, but Deng's judgment... Uh, was uh, somewhat tougher, and he, he had been on the front lines. Uh, one way I think about it is that Hu Yaobang in the 50s was in charge of the Youth League, and the, the person in charge of the Youth League tried to encourage young people, get them interested, hobbies. Deng was in charge of the party, and the buck stops there. And the person, he had to be responsible in the final analysis for keeping order, and that was a very heavy, weighty responsibility, and uh, many people felt he erred on the side of trying to keep order. Uh, but I, I, as a Western scholar, I find it a very tough judgment. And so what I've ended up doing, some people may think it's a mealy mouth out, but I didn't know any better way. I tried to describe the two views, and I, I, I don't think it's clear uh, whether Hu Yaobang's way would have succeeded more or not. I don't, mm -hmm. there's no way of that counterfactual, knowing that counterfactual, I just really try to describe how those two sides felt and acted. Ezra, the way I would phrase it, uh, uh, subject to your views, Deng had no interest in bringing political democracy to China. Uh, I've heard from his own lips his justification for Chinese Communist Party rule. China needed rapid economic development, it could only have rapid development under conditions of stability. You could only have stability in China under conditions of one party, Chinese Communist Party rule. That was his justification. It wasn't based on Marxism, Leninism. It wasn't based on things. It was based on the pragmatic feeling that only the Chinese Communist Party could assure the stability in China necessary for rapid economic development. So it wasn't that he was opposed to democracy. He simply thought democracy was inconsistent with the conditions necessary for his number one goal, which was uh, uh, rapid economic development. I would uh, qualify that just a little bit in this way, that he also felt to get people to have the incentive, you had to give them a certain amount of leeway. Oh, yes. That in order to uh, get... Well, he opened up China. There's no yes. question about and, that. And yeah. to yeah. get intellectuals to do their job as scientists... Yeah. You, and, and to get factory managers, you had to have a certain amount of leeway. So uh, probably you wouldn't call that – it's, not, it's yeah. not what we would call democracy. But he certainly realized the need for giving a, room, a bigger room for freedom than people had under Mao. Right. Yeah. Please keep your – we only have a few minutes left, so please keep questions short. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, my name is Larry Smarin, and uh, – First of all, I want to apologize for being a little late. There's a lot of traffic on Constitution Avenue. Uh, but my question is this. Um, in regard to uh, the 1969 Lin Biao affair, uh, Mao's uh, success and close yeah. comrade in arms, uh, and uh, if you can enlighten us a little on that, um, uh, and uh, what, if any, role did Deng play in that, in uh, ultimately Mao's... Um, 
ascendants and uh, Lin's uh, demise, if I can use those terms. In, in 1971, Deng was down in the countryside. Uh, he, he went there in, in uh, late 69, didn't come back till 73. When Lin Biao died, he immediately thought, aha, uh, he wrote a letter to Mao uh, and uh, in a sense said, uh, I, I will be available. Uh, if, if you need me. <laughs> and Mao didn't act right away. It wasn't until some time later that Mao acted. His daughter told me uh, that of the ten marshals, uh, there was only one he didn't get along with or didn't like or something uh, that affect Lin Biao. So, uh, you know, some people say that in the early 1950s, Lin Biao and Deng were among the leading candidates for Mao's successors, so there may have been a certain kind of rivalry. Of course, Lin Biao is a special kind of person, very secretive, and after his uh, head injury, a uh, very overly sensitive kind of person. Uh, and wasn't uh, some? he was very bright. He was not just a good general. He was a very bright and thoughtful, uh, very smart, uh, but uh, Deng and he were very different. So in, in a sense... It was only after Lin Biao's death in 1971 uh, that Mao decided to bring Deng back and give him. And then uh, Deng uh, tried to take a lot of those generals who'd risen to power uh, under Lin Biao, push them out, and bring back a lot of the senior officials uh, who had been there before the Cultural Revolution. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I can see we could have continued a lot longer based on the interest here, but I'm... Uh, <clears throat> Please join me in thanking uh, Professor Vogel. <laughs> <laughs>